The First Opium War, 1839-1842, the pivotal clash between the British Empire and China's Qing Dynasty, ignited by China's crackdown on the opium trade spearheaded by Commissioner Lin Zexu. His bold seizure and destruction of over 20,000 crates of British opium led to a fierce military response, showcasing Britain's naval dominance and resulting in a devastating defeat for the Qing. The war ended with the Treaty of Nanjing in 1842, marking China's first unequal treaty which ceded Hong Kong to Britain, opened key ports to foreign trade, and severely undermined Chinese sovereignty, marking the beginning of what the Chinese call the Century of Humiliation. Welcome to the channel. Newcomers, good to meet you. Those returning, good to see you. You're supporting the channel just by watching, you know. But a like and subscribe always greases the wheels for the algorithm. And a look in the description, too, if you're inclined. Oh, and check us out on Facebook. We're building the community. But now, on to the topic for today. You know I have to get the introduction out of the way first. It is the first opium war. Of course, there will be a sequel. And I will publish that probably tomorrow, depending on when you're seeing this. Now, without further ado, let's begin, nice and relaxed, and we start from the beginning. Now, to understand the situation, we first have to go back to the mid-16th century, and we find ourselves in Macau, which, in 1557, the Portuguese leased as an outpost from the Ming dynasty, that is, the dynasty before the Qing, and they started direct maritime trade between Europe and China. Of course, other European countries were not to be left out. They quickly followed the trend by joining the Asian Maritime Trade Network to compete with Arab, Chinese, Indian, and Japanese merchants. The China-Europe trade increased after the Spanish conquest of the Philippines, too. Manila galleons carried South American silver to Asian trade from 1565 onward. But the imperial government required Chinese products to be traded for silver bullion making China a major hub. Now, of course, all of the silver will later become the main protagonist in the story, but we'll get to that soon enough. Now, skipping forward a little bit, beginning in 1635, British ships did sail to China, but only really occasionally. And when they did, they could only trade at a few different ports, that being Zhoushan, Xiamen, and Guangzhou, because they could not have formal contacts with China through the Chinese tributary system, which facilitated negotiations with most Asian nations. But with a royal charter for Far East trade, the British East India Company facilitated the official British trade. The East India Company controlled the Sino-European trade with its presence in India and the Royal Navy power. Now in the 1680s, the new Qing dynasty somewhat relaxed maritime trade regulations, which benefited trade, of course. Not quite full trade in the European sense, but certainly progress. Now, the island of Formosa, which in these days we call Taiwan, became Qing territory in 1683, and would remain so from then on, until the end of the Chinese Civil War. There's still arguments about this to this very day, but 
it's definitely a story for the Chinese Civil War and Aftermath video. We'll get to that eventually. Now, discussions about European subjugation were restrained for inbound foreign trade, Guangzhou, or in those days, and even sometimes in these days called Canton, became the preferred port. Now, you'll hear it referred to as Canton in topics of this time, and probably a few times within this video. And indeed, the main uh, tower in Guangzhou is still called Canton Tower. It's a beautiful tower if you have the opportunity to go up to the top. It will cost you about 150 US dollars, but it's very much worth it. And that's if you don't go to the restaurant. Don't go to the restaurant. Well, anyway, back to back to the uh, old times. Now, the actual city of Guangzhou, if you know where that is on the map, you'll see why it's a preferred port. You see, ships had tried other ports, but Guangzhou, or Canton's strategic location at the Pearl River's entrance, was simply just too advantageous. The city's expertise in managing Beijing, Chinese merchants and foreign traders' competing interests, however, was lacking in these ports. And Canton, being so far south, and you could get away with a fair bit when you're that far away from Beijing, believe me, became China's maritime hub around the year 1700. Now, to regulate this market, the Qing government created the Canton system over time, and trade in China had been lucrative for European and Chinese merchants since the mid-1800s. But Europe's demand for tea, porcelain, and silk justifies travel to Asia, and in great magnitude. The Qing dynasty knew that they were on the receiving end of quite a good deal. The foreigners wanted more of the Chinese stuff than the Chinese wanted of theirs, and that gives you quite a bit of bargaining power. Well, the Qing administration regulated the system quite strictly. You see, foreign traders could only trade through the Kohong, and they were actually forbidden from learning Chinese. How Anyway, now non-natives could only live in the 13 factories and could not trade anywhere else in China and just weren't allowed. Only lower-ranking government officials could negotiate and the imperial court could not be swayed for non-diplomatic purposes. And there were laws known as the Prevention of Barbarians audience, Ordinances, rather, which upheld this system. That's right. They were calling them Barbarians. It's not a mistranslation. It's just how they viewed them. Well, the old China trade relied on the Kohong that, to assess foreign goods, decide whether to import them, and price up the Chinese exports. The Kohong had about six to twenty merchant families, depending on Canton's politics, and most of these families' trading houses were founded by low-ranking mandarins, but some were Cantonese or Han. Now, the Cantonese are the local Yue people in Guangdong and a few other provinces around that are neighbouring it. The Han are the general Chinese people. I believe they make up about 80... 82% maybe? Perhaps so. We also find that the Cantonese are called the Yue people. Now, a customary agreement between a Kohong member and a foreign trader was another important Kohong role, and they had to facilitate all of these little bits of red tape. 
This bond held the receiving Kohong member responsible for the foreign merchant's conduct and goods in China. European traders had to deal with the Kohong, which was quite painful. Pay customs fees, measurement charges, offer gifts, and even hire local navigators. Rivers are a bit complicated in the Pearl River Delta. Now, due to their popularity in Europe, commodities like silk and porcelain drove trade, despite all of the restrictions. Additionally, the British people were completely obsessed with Chinese tea. In fact, Europe did supply China with 28 million kilograms, or 61 million pounds of silver, from the mid-17th century, just to get all of these goods. All of that silver going from their pockets to the Chinese pockets. And, well, once the tea is all drunk, you've got nothing left. So one side has, well, a giant pile of silver. The other side has nothing. A happy aristocracy, perhaps. It's got to be worth something. Now, China and Europe, they traded vigorously for over a century. And despite European trade deficits due to Chinese dominance, the Chinese goods continued to boost commerce. The colonization and subjugation of the Americas at the same time gave Spain, Great Britain and France a pretty cheap source of silver, which helped stabilize the European economy despite the trade imbalance with China. Silver was directly shipped to China over the Pacific Ocean, especially by the Spanish-controlled Philippines. And Qing China was enjoying a great trade surplus, unlike Europe. Foreign silver in exchange for Chinese goods boosted the Chinese economy like never before. Today's not seen since probably the Tang Dynasty. Arguably, the glory days of the Ming Dynasty, perhaps. However, it caused inflation, and it effectively made China completely dependent on European silver, and that is a problem. Now, European demand for precious metals also increased as economies grew in the 17th and 18th centuries, and these metals were needed to make... What? Coins. I hope you got it right. Of course, among other things, but mainly currency. I had to keep the mints running. Now, because of the need for hard currency in Europe, bullion for trade in China became much scarcer. And this bullion shortage raised prices and prompted competition between European and Chinese merchants. This market dynamic created a trade imbalance for European governments, who had to risk silver shortages in their economies to meet the demands of their Asian merchants, who continued to profit by selling valuable Chinese products to European consumers. The gradual impact was exacerbated by the mid-18th century British-Spanish colonial wars, which disrupted the global silver market, and created powerful new nations, like Mexico and the United States. European merchants trading with China began withdrawing their silver directly from circulation in Europe's already vulnerable economies to pay for Chinese goods after being denied cheap silver from the colonies. And this incited governments, who saw their economies shrink and developed a lot of hostility towards the Chinese for limiting European trade. Since China could buy Japanese silver, its money supply was stable and immune to silver price fluctuations, at least the really big ones. Now the trade surplus with Europe was maintained by low Chinese demand for European goods, 
and most people just couldn't afford them anyway. Not saying that China didn't have an aristocracy and an upper class, of course they did, but not like Europe. Most of the Chinese were out living in the villages. Very few people were living in the big cities, at least comparatively if we're looking at percentages of populations. Now the trade surplus with Europe was maintained by all of this situation, and it would be for quite some time, but despite these challenges, China-Europe trade grew by 4% annually, at least before the opium trade began. Now, Chinese writings first mentioned opium as a medicine in the Tang Dynasty, so it wasn't a completely new thing, but opium use for recreational purposes was very rare. And like India, Arab merchants bought opium to China and Southeast Asia. When opium was a dry powder, it was mixed with tea or water. But due to its association with luxury and excess, the Ming Dynasty banned tobacco in 1640. Opium? Well, that was a minor issue. It didn't really get or require much attention. But in 1729, the Qing dynasty banned madak, which is a powdered opium-tobacco mixture. Now, since pure opium was hard to store, most of the opium imported to China was used for madak manufacturing. Javanese opium consumption rose in the 18th century too, and after the Napoleonic Wars and British occupation of Java, British merchants dominated the opium trade. The British found that trading addictive opium with Chinese industries reduced their trade deficit. Finally, there was something that the Chinese wanted, that the English had. Thus, they worked to boost opium productions in their Indian colonies. The British restricted Indian opium sales in 1781, and as the East India Company consolidated its control over India, exports to China began to increase. After taking over the Mughal Empire's opium economy in Bengal and the Ganges River Plain, the British grew opium for export. The East India Company commissioned and managed many poppy plantations. It was carefully extracted from pots, dried, shaped into cakes, coated, and packaged for sale. The company owned all opium until it was sold and tightly controlled the industry. Now the board also granted licenses to the autonomous princely republics of Malwa, where large amounts of poppies were farmed and protected poppies planted on company land. By the end of the 18th century, factory-made cotton fabric hurt the company and Malwan farmlands which grew cotton. Egyptian or American South cotton was used to make this fabric. Opium was a profitable substitute and sold in larger quantities at Calcutta auctions. Thus the British Royal Charter for Trade in Asia allowed merchants with company charters to buy goods at the Calcutta auction before sailing to southern China. British ships delivered goods to the coastal islands like Linden Island. Chinese merchants distributed goods inland using fast but heavily armed small boats. Chinese dealers traded silver for opium. Opium importation was initially allowed by the Qing because it could generate indirect tax revenue from the Chinese citizens. Little did they know how big the problem was about to become. Now, opium consumption in China persisted, threatening social stability. This habit spread throughout northern and western China from the south, 
and it affected all social classes. Many Chinese started using opium recreationally in the early 19th century, but for many what started as a hobby became a serious addiction. Those who stopped using opium experienced chills, nausea and cramping, and some even died from withdrawal. After becoming addicted, people would do anything to keep using the drugs the social dynamic of China began to change. The streets were no longer safe. Well, the Qing government issued an edict against the drug in 1780, and a complete ban in 1796 to address these major social issues. In 1799, the Canton governor ordered the complete ban of the drug Foreign merchants bought older ships and converted them into mobile storage facilities to avoid Canton's stricter laws. The ships were stationed near the Chinese shore at the Pearl River entrance in anticipation of Chinese opium trade suppression. But because the Chinese navy struggled at sea, this was necessary. Chinese opium merchants bought opium from inbound vessels after they transferred some of their cargo to these floating storage facilities. The smuggling system allowed foreign merchants to avoid Chinese authorities and protect their legitimate commodity trade, in which several smugglers were involved. But it wasn't just the British. The Americans were involved too. They began importing Turkish opium into China in the early 19th century. It was a cheaper, but lower quality supply. British and American merchants competed to lower opium prices, which made it more accessible to the average Chinese consumer. And thus, opium demand skyrocketed in China, making it very lucrative. Now, of course, there were Chinese opium traffickers. Unlike their European counterparts, they could legally travel and sell items in the Chinese interior, and they began actively seeking new sources. Due to the supply shortage, more European merchants entered the lucrative opium trade to meet the Chinese demand. A trading firm representative said opium is as valuable as gold, and he could sell it at any time, anywhere. In 1804 to 1820, the Qing treasury had to suppress the White Lotus Rebellion and other conflicts, and it was at this time when Chinese merchants began exporting silver to pay for opium, instead of Europeans using it to buy Chinese goods. The pendulum was about to swing, it seems. Well, European and American ships with opium cargo reached Canton, where they sold their goods, bought Chinese goods, and made a profit in pure silver. The silver would then be used to buy more Chinese goods. Well, despite opium being the most profitable commodity for trading with China, European merchants began exporting machine-spun cotton cloth, ginseng, fur, clocks, and steel equipment. However, these commodities were never as important or ever as profitable as opioids. Now, what did the Qing government think about all this? Well, they knew the risks of provoking the ire of those, well, let's call them free trade enthusiasts. But they did debate ending the opium trade. But they were thwarted by local authorities and the Kohong who profited from the opium bribes and taxes. Qing officials' attempts to restrict opium imports 
and the use led to a rise in European and Chinese drug trafficking and corruption. Now, the Daoguang Emperor decreed in 1810 regarding opium, and this is what he said. Opium has harm. Opium is a poison, undermining our good customs and morality. Its use is prohibited by law. Now, the commoner, Yang, dares to bring it into the forbidden city. Indeed, he flouts the law. However, recently, the purchasers, the eaters, and consumers of opium have become numerous. Deceitful merchants buy and sell it to gain profit. The customs house at the Chongwen Gate has originally set up to supervise the collection of imports. It had no responsibility with regard to opium smuggling. If we confine our search for opium to the seaports, we fear the stretch will not be sufficiently thorough. We should also order a general commandment of the police censors at the five gates to prohibit opium and to search for it at all gates. If they capture any violators, they should immediately punish them and should destroy the opium at once. As to Guangdong and Fujian, the provinces from which opium comes, we order their viceroys, governors, and superintendents of the maritime customs to conduct a thorough search for opium and cut off its supply. They should, in no ways, consider this order a dead letter and allow opium to be smuggled out. Well, this is all good and well, but by 1831, the annual opium trade reached over 20,000 chests. How much was a chest? Well, one chest weighed 140 pounds. Now, this is a massive increase from 1800 to 1818's average of 4,000 chests. Now, that's a five times increase. They can see how popular opium was getting. Now, along with the economic and social progress, the opium trade changed the Sino-European trade dynamic. Mercantilism, mercantilism, excuse me, lost academic acceptance in Britain, as Adam Smith and other economists developed classical economics. But back in China, the Qianlong Emperor restricted foreign trade to licensed Chinese merchants only. Under a monopoly charter, the British government gave the British East India Company exclusive trade rights, before Western societies adopted free trade in the 19th century. This arrangement was unchallenged. The Industrial Revolution, however, led Britain to use its growing naval power to promote a liberal economic model with open markets and free trade. This policy followed the economics of Adam Smith, or Smithian economics, if we want to call them that. Now, these trade policies also allowed British colonies resources to enter international markets, and increased tea availability for the British population. The British Empire produced a standardised silver shilling after the gold standard was implemented in 1821. And this, of course, put a lot more demand on silver, and it prompted the British government to seek more trading privileges in China. Now, the Qing dynasty, they followed a more Confucian modernist economic theory that stressed government interference in industry to maintain social stability, which is quite unlike the new model. Now, although the Qing administration did not oppose commerce in any strict sense, their low import demand and high luxury item levies 
reduce the incentive for the government to expand international trade ports. Chinese merchant hierarchy, inflexibility hindered efforts to open ports for foreign ships and businesses. Inland Chinese merchants wanted to avoid market volatility caused by foreign goods competing with local production. Maintaining exclusive control over foreign product entry points made the Canton Kohong families extremely wealthy. Now Great Britain, the Netherlands, Denmark, Russia and the United States sought more trading privileges in China in the early 19th century. Free trade was all the rage, and violating those agreements of free trade, well, that was cardinal sin. Everybody had to get along. The Western nation's main concern was the Canton system's end and trade access to China's vast consumer markets. Britain was exporting more to China after the empire adopted the gold standard too, and this forced Britain to buy silver and gold from Europe and Mexico to fuel its rapid industrialization. Of course, right in the middle of that golden age of the Industrial Revolution. The British Embassy under McCartney in 1793 the Dutch mission under Van Brahm in 1794, and the Russian delegation under Yuri Golovkin in 1805, with the British again with William Amherst in 1816, all sought greater access to Chinese markets. But the Qing emperors rejected these efforts repeatedly. In 1816, Amherst met the Jiaqing Emperor and refused to kowtow to him, which the Qing considered to be very impolite. Now the British government was of course furious when the Qing expelled Amherst and his party from China. Don't want to fit in? Get the hell out of here. Well, as they say, do as the Romans do. You know, it does remind me of a, uh, there was a story of when the Beatles, I think it was, first went to Japan for their tour, and they were invited to play for the Emperor. And, well, I don't know what the exact situation was, but they refused to do so. It might have been because they were too busy, the schedule didn't permit it, or simply because they had no interest in going and playing for the Emperor. But either way, the Japanese were not happy with them, and were well, public opinion somewhat well, turned against the Beatles. I'm not a big fan of them anyway. I think the Beach Boys are better. Now, of course, the British consumer's love of Chinese tea and other Chinese silk products was a major factor in all this. However, Chinese buyers simply did not like the British products. Britain had to use more silver to pay for its Chinese commodity purchases due to the trade imbalance. So, there was a massive deficit. And there had been for quite a long time. In fact, the Chinese only accepted silver for their goods, which completely drained the British Empire of this valuable resource. And those colonies, well, they were starting to dry up. Especially the United States. They weren't going to get much silver from them, weren't they? Now, as its merchants gained influence in southern China, Britain began to strengthen its military to defend Macau from French attacks, remember that was a Portuguese colony then, Britain established a permanent military presence in 1808 and sent naval vessels to the Pearl River to combat piracy. The opium-dependent China foreign presence in Canton and Macau increased, as did trade value. Now, Canton's 13 factories district grew into the now-named Foreign 
quarter. Most traders moved to Macau in summer, and back to Canton in winter, but a few actually started living there permanently. Thus a regional business association was formed. The first twenty years of the nineteenth century saw improved and more profitable trade between Europe and China, allowing a group of European merchants to actually gain a bit of influence. William Jardine and James Matheson famous British merchants, founded a Canton and Macau consignment and shipping company. Later, they founded Jardine Matheson. They relied on the Jamset G. Gigiboy, their Indian supplier. All three men traded legitimate goods, but also made a lot of money selling opium. Jardine manipulated Canton politics to increase narcotics imports into China, and he also hated the Chinese legal system, and used his wealth to undermine Chinese officials. Matheson supported his call for the British government to use force to gain trading privileges and political recognition from imperial China. Trade also brought Western missionaries to China to spread Christianity. Macau-based Jesuits had been in China since the early 17th century. But some officials allowed them and others clashed with the Chinese Christians. Which, well, that's a... They had a bad time. The history of Christianity in China is, uh, well, it's quite a roller coaster. I did do a video on the Taiping Rebellion, the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, whichever one you want to refer to. Perhaps you're interested in that. Well, either way, with all of these clashes, Western merchants and Qing officials began to fight more and more. As the foreign population in Canton gained more power and influence, the Chinese local government began to fight internally. The Qing Dynasty's silver treasury was also depleted by the White Lotus Rebellion from 1796 to 1804, which forced merchants to pay higher taxes. Well, despite suppressing the uprising, the Chinese government launched the Yellow River Conservancy to restore Yellow River state-owned assets. Taxes were not lowered also had a lot of problems with banditry, and to fight all of that the merchants had to contribute too. Just constant pickpocketing. Well, these levies, of course, hurt the Kohong merchants' profits, causing a major decline by the 1830s. The depreciation of China's currency led many Canton residents to use foreign silver coins. In fact, Spanish coins were the most valuable, followed by American coins due to their higher silver content. Melting down Western coins allowed Cantonese coiners to make many Chinese coins. Of course, this was extremely illegal. <laughs> you can't get away with that anymore. Well, this practice increased the city's wealth and tax revenue while solidifying its economic dependence on foreign merchants. The Charter Act of 1834 ended the British East India Company's monopoly, by the way, which was a major victory for the free trade advocates in Britain, and in part it was funded by Jardine. Changing trade policy eliminated merchants' need to follow the Royal Charter for Far East Trade, and private entrepreneurs exploited the lucrative opium trade to enter the British China route. Now, before the actual complete ban was really getting enforced, rather, there was one Chinese official who described the social changes. It's an interesting translation, so do bear with it. At the beginning, opium smoking was confined to the fops of wealthy families 
who took up the habit as a form of conspicuous consumption, even though they knew that they should not indulge in it to the greatest extreme. But later, people of all social strata, from government officials and members of the gentry to craftsmen, merchants, entertainers and servants, and even women, Buddhist monks and nuns, Taoist priests, took up the habit, and openly bought and equipped themselves with smoking instruments. Even in the centre of our dynasty, the nation's capital and its surrounding areas, some of the inhabitants have been contaminated by this dreadful poison. Sounds pretty serious, don't you think? <laughs> well, obviously his opinion on the opium is... Uh, He's pretty much stating it as clear as he can. Well, after the East India Company's exclusive rights expired in 1834, the British government sent Lord William John Napier, along with John Francis Davis, Sir George Best Robinson, who was the second baronet, to Macau to oversee Chinese commerce. Napier was ordered to follow Chinese law, communicate with Chinese authorities, monitor opium trade transactions, and study China's coastline. After reaching China, Napier wrote to the Viceroy of Liangguang, which is Lu Kun, to arrange a meeting to circumvent the strict system that forbade direct communication with Chinese authorities. And just before we move on, Liangguang meaning the two Guangs, right? Liang meaning two, Guang meaning the Guangdong and Guangxi province. And back then they were kind of administered as the same kind of entity, so we just call them Liangguang. Now, after rejecting it, the Viceroy issued an edict on the 2nd of September that halted British commerce. In response, Napier ordered two Royal Navy ships to attack Chinese fortifications on the Pearl River Strait, specifically the Boca Tigris, to show military might, and the command was successful. But Napier ended up contracting typhoid, and he ordered a retreat, which prevented the war, at least for now. The British government and foreign commerce criticised the short gunfight, and the Chinese government were equally as unhappy with it. Now, while other countries, like the Americans, for example, thrived on peaceful trade with China, the British were told to leave Canton for Huangpu or Macau. Now, in September, Lord Napier did return to Macau, and it seems that the typhus had caught up with him, and he died on October 11th. Now, after his death in 1836, the king appointed Captain Charles Elliot, superintendent of trade, to continue his Chinese reconciliation efforts. British opium exports to China at this time exceeded 1,400 tons, and the Chinese government were even debating legalizing the substance. But of course, every single time, they were rejected. Thus, in 1838, the government began capitally punishing Chinese drug traffickers. And in 2024, they all get the worst and most strict penalty. You can imagine what they would get about 150 years ago. Gruesome fates await all of them. Now, also, long-term causes prompted the Chinese government to act. Social dislocations in the Qing world addiction, this hard-line attitude towards foreigners, and the foreign refusal to accept any normal Chinese ways of life and culture, changes in international trade structures, and the end of Western intellectuals' admiration for China, well, they all contributed to a very grim picture. The market also shrank, 
and dealers became dangerously oversupplied after the harsh prohibitions of 1838. A deputy of the British Crown held the new post of superintendent of foreign trade in China, which contributed to worsening communication issues. The Chinese would insult the British nation openly, but not the business cooperation. After all, it all comes down to money, doesn't it? The line that they will not cross. But they were certainly willing to cross the new superintendent, who was equally just as willing to cross them. The problem was, the superintendent could directly call on British forces and the Royal Navy, if the situation was dire enough. Now, with that, we arrive at Lin Shu, a scholar official who was appointed Special Imperial Commissioner to the Daoguang, by the Daoguang Emperor, rather, in 1839, to put an end to the opium trade, the Emperor's strong man. Now, Lin's famous letter to Queen Victoria appealed directly to Victoria's morality. Lin questioned Britain's morality, since its merchants profited from China's legal opium trade, while opium was still illegal in Britain. Rules for me and not for thee. Well, that's a tale as old as time, isn't it? The translation from the letter written by Lin Zhu to Queen Victoria directly is as following. Your Majesty has not before been thus officially notified, and you may plead ignorance of the severity of our laws, but I now give my assurance that we mean to cut this harmful drug forever. Well, the letter unfortunately never reached the Queen, with one source suggesting that it was simply lost in transit. Well, Lin pledged that nothing would divert him from the mission, and he went on to say, If the traffic in opium were not stopped a few decades from now, we shall not only be without soldiers to resist the enemy, but also in want of silver to provide an army. And thus Lin banned opium sales and ordered the Chinese government to take all supplies, he also blocked the Pearl River Channel, confining British merchants to Canton. After seizing the opium reserves in warehouses and thirteen factories, Chinese military forces boarded British ships in the Pearl River and the South China Sea and destroyed their cargo. Of course, the British were not too happy about this, as you can imagine. In a formal objection, the British Superintendent of Trade in China, Charles Elliot, yes, that one that we had mentioned just before, opposed the forced confiscation of the opium reserves. He ordered opium ships to leave immediately and prepare for battle. Lin responded by surrounding foreign merchants in Canton's foreign district, preventing them from reaching their ships in the harbour. To calm the situation, Elliot convinced British businessmen to work with the Chinese authorities and surrender their opium reserves, and of course he promised to reimburse them. Now, the exchequer was burdened financially by tacitly acknowledging that the British government supported the trade. In order to avoid political backlash, the British government refused to fulfil this promise which led to the British attack. And in April and May of 1839, British and American traders gave up 20,000 chests and 200 opium bags. Close to Canton, the stockpile was gathered up, and it was destroyed. Now, after surrendering the opium, trade resumed but with a strict condition that China would not accept any more shipments. So they could only sell the opium that they already had there. No new opium. 
Lin and his advisors also overhauled the bond system to regulate international trade and eliminate corruption. In this arrangement, a foreign captain and the Kohong merchant who bought his ship's goods were sworn to integrity. Lin was, however, furious to find no opium violations in twenty years after the ban, after reviewing the port's records. It was pretty obvious that people were letting things slide. In reality, the opium was getting through. On paper, they were just pretending there was no problem. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Well, Lin Zexu, of course, is not an idiot, so he required all foreign merchants and Qing officials to sign a new agreement, promising explicitly not to trade opium. But this time, they had to sign the agreement with the fine print that all of the violators would receive capital punishment. And that includes not just any Chinese smugglers or dealers, but people from outside. And the capital punishments in China were, well, they were imaginative. Let's just put it that way. Well, the British government, of course, were opposed to the bond under the guise of free trade, which was the thing that everyone was taking as gospel back in those days. In fact, there were many people who had this opinion that free trade would be the thing that stops all of the wars. Remember, this is a post-Napoleonic world, and in that roughly 100 years after the defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo and the outbreak of the First World War, there weren't too many large-scale conflicts. There was an idea among many economists that being so wrapped up in free trade would effectively make the world so bonded together that wars just would not be worth fighting. Of course, they said the same thing when the World's Fair unveiled the invention of the machine gun, saying that if everybody had one of them, no one would be fighting anymore. Quite scarily, they say the same thing about nuclear weapons. Hmm. Well, this is not a horror channel. Well, as we were saying, the British government opposed it because it violated free trade principles. But there were opium-free merchants, like Oliphant and co., who signed the bond. But that was against Elliot's advice. Normal trade did continue, while the confiscation of foreign warehouses caused opium shortages, and with that a thriving black market. Some newly arrived merchant vessels learned of the opium ban and offloaded their goods at Lindin Island before entering the Pearl River estuary. Some Kohong trade houses and smugglers profited from the opium price spike. They smuggled more opium into China, despite Commissioner Lin's efforts. Superintendent Elliot was aware of the Lindin smugglers' illegal operations and ordered them to stop immediately. But he refrained from deploying his ships, because he feared a Royal Navy intervention would start a war. A group of British merchant seamen in Kowloon became drunk one evening on rice liquor in early July of 1839, and the two restless sailors killed a resident of Chim Cha Joy, Lin Wei Shi. Now, Superintendent Elliot arrested the two, and they compensated the family and village. He declined, however, a plea to surrender the sailors to Chinese authorities, fearing that they would be executed under Chinese law, which, well, they obviously would. You get drunk and bloody kill someone, you know. <laughs> what were you expecting, a slap on the wrist? Well, uh, actually, they probably were to be honest. Well, Commissioner Lin ordered the seamen's surrender, believing that this violated justice and Chinese autonomy. Elliot presided over a warship trial for the accused, with merchant captains as jurors. But the Qing authorities declined his invitation to observe and comment on the proceedings. 
five sailors were sentenced to fines and a little bit of hard labor back in Britain for assault and rioting by the naval court, but the British courts reversed the decisions. Now, Lin summoned Chinese workers from Macau and banned British food purchasers in anger over the territorial encroachment. The Qing government spread signals and rumors that war junks near the Pearl River entrance had contaminated freshwater springs that foreign commerce ships replenished with. Also, it didn't help that pirates attacked a famous opium trader's vessel downstream from Canton to Macau on the 23rd of August, in that same year, 1839. Now, the British believed that Chinese soldiers attacked the ship themselves. It may have been Chinese pirates, but there was certainly no explicit order given to, well, the pirates, because they were pirates, and certainly not to any soldiers to join in on this. It was just a raid, a robbery. But of course, when you get attacked by the Chinese, if we're going to say it that way, it doesn't matter if they're pirates or soldiers. You've still been attacked, and this is how the British felt. Well, either way, the uh, Elliot ordered all British vessels off the Chinese coast by August 24th. Now, Macau had agreed to Lin's request and banned British ships from its harbour on the same day the commissioner personally visited the city at that time, where some residents greeted him as a hero who had restored order. By the end of August, over 60 British ships and 2,000 people were stationed near the Chinese coast due to the Macau exodus, and they were lacking supplies. Elliot had warned Qing officials in Kowloon to lift the food and water ban on the 30th of August when HMS Volage arrived to protect the fleet from a Chinese attack. Well, on the morning of the 4th of September, Elliot sent an armed schooner and cutter to Kowloon to buy provisions from Chinese peasants. Two vessels approached three Chinese war junks in the harbour and requested permission to disembark personnel for provisions. Chinese sailors provided essentials to the British during passage. However, the Chinese commander in Kowloon Fort banned locals from trading with the British and restricted them within the colony. In the afternoon, Elliot gave the Chinese an ultimatum that they would be shot if they refused to let the British get supplies, which is probably the most ultimate of ultimatums you can give. Well, after Elliot's 3 p.m. deadline, nothing had changed. So, it was on. The British ships attacked the Chinese junks. The Chinese junks and land-based artillery fired back at the British vessels, but as night fell, the Chinese junks retreated, and the Battle of Kowloon was quite quickly over. Outmatched, I'm afraid. Many British officers wanted to do an all-out attack on Kowloon Fort on the next day, but Elliot refused, arguing that, yes, they would probably wipe the floor with them, but it would harm and annoy the town residents. Either way, after the skirmish, Elliot distributed a Kowloon document saying that the English wanted peace, but they cannot be poisoned or starved. They would not molest or hinder imperial ships, but they can't stop people from selling. Only the enemy deprives men of food. Well, after defeating the Qing forces, the fleet obtained and the British fleet, rather, obtained supplies from nearby villagers, often with the help of corrupt Kowloon officials. Kowloon commander Lai Enjue declared victory over the British, however. You see, he claimed that a two-masted British cruiser was deliberately sunk, killing 40 to 50 British sailors, 
and he also reported that the British had trouble getting supplies and also completely underestimated the Qing Navy. Not many people believed it. Well, late October 1839, the merchant ship Thomas Coots reached Canton. The Chinese authorities knew Coots' Quaker owners refused to trade opium for religious reasons, and good on them for putting principle above profit. Chalk up one point to the Quakers, shall we? Now, the ship's captain, Warner, believed that Elliot had exceeded his legal authority by prohibiting the no-opium trade agreement and consulted with Canton's governor. Warner wanted all British vessels, except those transporting opium, of course, to negotiate legitimately to offload at Chuan Pi, which is an island near Humen, which is, if you know your Chinese geography, it's kind of south of Dongguan. Elliot blockaded British maritime traffic in the Pearl River to prevent other British vessels from following Thomas Coates. Hostilities began on the 3rd of November 1839, when the Royal Saxon, a second British ship, attempted to reach Canton. Royal Saxon was warned by British Royal Navy ships HMS Volage and HMS Hyacinth, and in response to these disturbances, Guan Tian Pei led a Chinese warship fleet to defend Royal Saxon. After the first battle of Chuan Pi, both forces retreated after four Chinese war junks were sank. Qing Navy officials claimed they saved the British merchant ship at the Battle of Chuan Pi and declared a major victory. Now you see, the British ships they were, well, of quite a better class than the Chinese one. And Elliot said that his squadron was guarding the 29 superior ships in Chuan Pi and preparing for Qing retaliation. Now, assuming the Chinese would refuse to communicate with the British and use fire rafts as an attack, he ordered the evacuation of all ships from Chuan Pi to Causeway Bay which is about 20 miles from Macau. The ships were to be anchored offshore to avoid Lin's forces. Elliot asked the Portuguese governor of Macau, Adriel Acasio de Silveria Pinto, to allow British ships to load and unload their goods at the port in exchange for rental fees and customs. The governor declined due to concerns that China may stop supplying Macau with food and other necessities. All foreign merchants in China were asked to stop supporting the British on January 14, 1840. Well, after China had completely banned the opium trade, Britain's response was under the microscope. British and American public outrage over Britain's opium trade led to this. East India and China Association of London claimed that the government authorized the opium trade and demanded compensation for their losses. Thus, Elliot issued certificates ensuring payment for the opium given over, expecting China to simply pay the bill. Well, this allowed merchants to legally request compensation from the British government, which they could force China to pay or cover from the British treasury. Since Elliot had convinced them to send a military expedition to China, they preferred to force China to pay due to their cash shortage. But in fact, and it's got to be noted, that many British citizens sympathized with the Chinese because they knew how bad opium was and they wanted an end to it, while others, more moderates, I suppose, wanted a more stricter regulation on the global narcotics trade. However, Qing China's mistreatment of British diplomats 
and trade practices was the real spark of outrage. The Whig-dominated administration advocated military conflict, for military conflict rather, with China, while pro-Whig media highlighted the Chinese, quote, tyranny and brutality. This was the main reason for the war with China. You see, London newspapers began reporting on Canton conflicts and the upcoming war with China as early as August of 1839, and in her annual address to the House of Lords on the 16th of January 1840, the Queen expressed her concerns about the events in China that had disrupted trade between her subjects and that country. And this is what she said from the recorded address. Events have happened in China which have occasioned an interruption of the commercial intercourse of my subjects with that country. I have given and shall continue to give the most serious attention to a matter so deeply affecting the interest of my subjects and the dignity of the crown. Now, in terms of politics, well, it was as precarious as always with the Whig Melbourne government. With 21 votes in favour, the government narrowly avoided a no-confidence vote on the 31st of January 1840. The Tories saw the China question as an opportunity to outdo the government, if we want to use those terms, and James Graham presented a motion in the House of Commons on the 7th of April, 1840, criticising the government's lack of anticipation and precaution, and also their failure to give the superintendent at Canton the authority and guidance to address the opium trade. To maximise party support for the motion, the Tories avoided war and opium trafficking. The military action proposed received mixed reactions from the Parliament. Foreign Secretary Palmerston, known for his assertiveness and support for free trade, led the military intervention faction. You see, Palmerston, he believed that the destroyed opium should be considered property, not contraband, despite the fact that it was illegal. He just saying that part very quietly. Thus, he demanded compensation for its destruction. It was property damage. He defended the military intervention by saying that no one could honestly believe that the Chinese government was promoting morality. He also claimed that the war was being fought to correct China's balance of payments. After consulting with William Jardine, the Foreign Secretary wrote to Prime Minister William Melbourne, urging military retaliation. Additionally, merchants advocated for unrestricted commerce with China, and Chinese consumers were often blamed for opium traffic. British merchants repeated expulsion from Canton, and the Qing government's refusal to recognise Britain as a diplomatic peer were seen as grave insults to national dignity. Sir James Graham, Lord Philip Stanhope, and William Edward Gladstone led the British anti-war movement and criticised the opium trades on its moral grounds. Following three days of intense debate, Graham's proposal was voted on April 9th, 1840, and it failed by a mere nine votes, with 262 in favour and 271 against. Conservative MPs failed to persuade the government to end the war and stop the British warships heading to Canton. In July 27th, 1840, the House of Commons approved a £170,000 sum for the China expedition, despite the fact that the war was already well underway. On October 1st, 1839, the Whig cabinet under Prime Minister Melbourne sent an expedition to China in response to pressure from the Trade and Manufacturers Associations, 
the war preparations were officially underway. Now, Palmerston ordered Auckland, the Governor General of India, to mobilize troops for China in November of 1839. Palmerston, who was unaware of the First Battle of Chuan Pi in November of 1839, wrote two letters on February 20, 1840, outlining the British response to China. The Elliots received one letter, while the Daoguang Emperor and Qing authorities received the other. The Emperor of China was informed that Great Britain had sent a military expedition to China's coast, and the letters from Palmerston stated that Great Britain's hostility towards China was justified and even necessary because of the Chinese authorities' outrages against the British officers and subjects, and it would not come to an end until the Chinese government makes a satisfactory arrangement, which you can imagine is probably going to be a little bit one-sided in favor of the British. Well, that's just what happens when you are the one with the bigger cannons. Well, Palmerston's letter to the Elliots instructed commanders to blockade the Pearl River. Additionally, they were to deliver Palmerston's message to a Chinese official for the Chinese emperor. The next step was to seize control of the Zhoushan Islands, blockade the Yangtze River mouth, negotiate with Qing authorities, and navigate the fleet into the Bohai Sea to send Beijing another copy of the letter. And with that, Palmerston outlined the objectives that were listed for the British government goals, and they were as follows. 1. The demand to be treated with respect due to a royal envoy by the Qing authorities. 2. Secure the right of the British superintendent to administer justice to British subjects in China. 3. Seek recompense for destroyed British property. 4. Gain most favoured trading status with the Chinese government. 5. Request the right for foreigners to safely inhabit and own private property within China. 6. Ensure that, if contraband is seized in accordance with Chinese law, no harm comes to the person or persons of British subjects carrying illicit goods in China. 6. End the system by which British merchants are restricted to trading solely in Canton. 7. Ask that the cities of Canton, Amoy, Shanghai, Ningbo, and the province of northern Formosa be freely open to trade from all foreign powers, and finally, secure islands along the Chinese coasts that can be easily defended and provisioned, or exchange captured islands for favourable trading terms. Lord Palmerston left it to Superintendent Elliot's discretion as to how these objectives would be fulfilled, but noted that while negotiation would be a preferable outcome, he simply did not trust that diplomacy would be enough to be successful. In his final correspondence he wrote, To sum up in a few words the result of this instruction, you will see, from what I have stated, that the British government demands from that of China satisfaction for the past and security for the future, and does not choose to trust a negotiation for obtaining either of these things, but has sent out a naval and military force with orders to begin at once to take the measures necessary for attaining the object in view. Now, a lack of significant headquarters in China led the British to remove their commercial ships. However, the Royal Navy's China squadron remained in the Pearl River Estuary Islands. Palmerston ordered the East India Company to redirect troops from India in anticipation of a limited conflict with the Chinese while in London. But instead of a large-scale war, a punitive expedition was chosen. 
Superintendent Elliot oversaw Britain's China affairs in general, while Commodore James Bremer led the Royal Marines and the China Squadron. Major General Hugh Goff led British land forces, and later became British Forces in China Commander. Nice little promotion there for him. Well, the British government would fully fund the war, and according to Lord Palmerston's correspondence, the British had already planned a series of attacks on Chinese ports and waterways. The preparations for an expeditionary army began immediately after the vote in January 1840. In the British Isles, infantry regiments were established and shipbuilding was accelerated. Britain began using military forces from its overseas dominions for the upcoming conflict, and they had plenty of overseas dominions, don't you worry about that, the peak of the British Empire. Now, British India, of course, was one of those colonies, and they prepared for war after hearing of the opium being destroyed under the command of Linzer Shu. They recruited many Bengali volunteer battalions to support their British Indian Army and East India Company forces. The expedition ships were either in distant colonies or being repaired. But then, of course, there was the Oriental Crisis of 1840, which threatened war between Britain, France, and the Ottoman Empire over Syria, which, of course, diverted the Royal Navy's European fleets from China, at least for a little while. British South Africa and Australia were ordered to send ships to Singapore, the expedition's meeting location, and several Royal Navy steamers were sent on the expedition as cargo ships. Atypical summer weather in India and the Strait of Malacca hampered the British deployment, and several incidents hampered their combat capability. The Royal Navy's two 74-gun ships of the line, which were to attack the Chinese defences, were temporarily disabled by damage to the hulls. Either way, British forces gathered in Singapore by mid-June 1840, despite these delays. While waiting for the ships, the Royal Marines practised amphibious invasions on the beach, after disembarking from boats, they formed lines to advance towards simulated defences. These days we call them war games. Well, the expedition's first group reached China in June of 1840 on 15 barracks ships, four powered, well, steam-powered gunboats, and 25 smaller boats. Commodore Bremer led the flotilla. Now, the British demanded financial compensation from the Qing government for trade disruptions and opium destruction. This is as we mentioned in part one after Lin Zexu confiscated it and basically destroyed the lot of it. Well, of course, over and over, the request was denied by the Qing government and the authorities in Canton. The Chinese would not give an inch, even though they knew they were severely outgunned. This was a war of principle for them. Well, Palmerston gave Elliot and his cousin Admiral George Elliot instructions to transfer at least one Chinese coastline island for commercial use. A combined naval and ground attack on Zhou Shan archipelago began after the British Expeditionary Force was positioned. The operation focused on Zhou Shan Island, the largest and most secure. The attack also sought to capture the island's strategic port of Dinghai. Elliot ordered Zhou Shan's surrender upon the British squadron's arrival but the Chinese garrison commander refused the order, 
claiming he could not submit, and questioning the British harassment of Dinghai given their expulsion from Canton. Hostilities began, and the Royal Navy destroyed a squadron of twelve small junks, and British marines took control of the southern Dinghai hills. Yes, it did not go very well for the Chinese defense. A fierce naval attack on the 5th of July forced the Chinese to retreat, allowing the British to take full control of the city. British forces took Dinghai Harbor and prepared to use it as a military base in China. In autumn of 1840, a Dinghai garrison illness forced the British to move their soldiers to Manila and Calcutta. At the start of 1841, only 1,900 of the 3,300 troops who had occupied Dinghai were still there, and many of them could simply not fight, well, because they were all bent over, vomiting all over themselves, most likely, while well, most of the 500 British soldiers who died from illness were actually not technically British. Most of them were volunteers from Cameroon and also Bengal, while the Royal Marines, <laughs> they were, of course, unaffected. Funny how that works. Perhaps they were kept in more sanitary conditions. Well, after capturing Dinghai, the British expedition split up its troops, sending one fleet south to the Pearl River and another north to the Yellow Sea. The northern fleet reached the High River, where Elliot personally delivered Palmerston's message to the Emperor of the Qing. Now, the imperial court appointed Qi Shan, a prominent Manchu official, to succeed Lin as viceroy of Liangguang after Lin's dismissal of his opium handling missteps. Qi Shan represented the Qing dynasty as chief negotiator while Elliot represented the British crown. Jijian and Elliot agreed to conduct future talks on the Pearl River after a week of negotiations. British representatives were politely asked, however, to leave the Yellow Sea. I don't know how politely, but, well, I'm sure the point was taken. Now, Jishan promised imperial funds to British merchants who lost money, and that's another deciding factor. But both factions continued to fight the war. In the late spring of 1841, more Indian troops arrived for a military campaign against Canton. Ships brought 600 skilled 37th Madras native infantry soldiers to Dinghai, boosting British morale. The newly built iron steamship HMS Nemesis, which is a badass name for a ship, accompanied the fleet to Macau. Chinese Navy had pretty much no effective defense against this powerful weapon. The cannons just would not even put a dent in it, and that's if the cannons could even reach it. Remember that the Chinese were using somewhat out of date weapons. A lot of them were. Weapons designed off or even purchased off the, Br off the Brits in uh, former times. Which, of course, the British would never sell the most up-to-date stuff. That would be stupid. Well, on August 19th, three British cruisers and 380 marines expelled the Chinese from what was known as the Barrier a land bridge separating Macau and the Chinese mainland. After the Qing soldiers' defeat and the arrival of the nemesis at Macau's harbour, pro-British sentiment rose, leading to the expulsion and death of several Qing officials. But what about Portugal? This was Macau, after all. Well, they chose to kind of sit back and just enjoy the show, remaining neutral throughout the fight. After all, they had their own interests in Macau, and it was too early to tell how things were going to go. 
It seemed pretty obvious the British were going to win from the outset, but, well, you never know. Well, after the battle, Portugal did allow British troops to dock in Macau, which gave the British a fully operational port in southern China. The British focused on the Pearl River conflict after securing Dinghai and Macau, and the northern expedition moved south to Hu Men, known as the Bog, after the British victory at Chusan. Bremer believed that seizing control of the Pearl River and Guangzhou, or Canton, would give the British a strong bargaining position with the Qing government and help trade resume after the war. Because, of course, after all the fighting is done, there is still money to be made. And this is where we have step in Admiral Guan Tian Pei, who strengthened Qing positions in Hu Men during the British Northern Campaign. Now, Guan may have prepared for a position attack since Napier's 1835 incident. He feared that the British would forcefully advance up the Pearl River towards Canton, and the river was subsequently blocked by 3,000 soldiers and 306 cannons in the Humen forts. When the British fleet was ready to fight, 10,000 Qing soldiers were strategically placed to protect Canton and its neighbours. Early January saw the British fleet attack the Qing defences at Junpi. This followed the Chinese deliberately launching fire rafts at the Royal Navy ships, which was, well, that was the strategy, the best strategy at the time for taking out ships without too much collateral damage. Well, the Second Battle of Junpi, on January 7, 1841, the British were victorious. They defeated 11 Chinese Southern Fleet junks, and they even took the forts at Hu Men. The British victory allowed them to blockade the Bogue, forcing the Qing Navy to retreat inland. Qi Shan negotiated a peace deal with Britain to avoid further escalation, because the Pearl River Delta was so important to China and the British Navy's dominance made it difficult to recapture. Thus, the Convention of Junpi, written by Qi Shan and Elliot on January 21st, sought to effectively end the war. The Convention exchanges Hong Kong Island for Zhou Shan, frees British shipwrecked or kidnapped prisoners, and reopens trade in Canton by the 1st of February 1841 to establish equitable diplomatic privileges between Britain and China. China was also meant to pay six million silver dollars for the 1838 opium disruption in Humen. However, the legality of the opium trade was intentionally left for later consideration. Although Qi Shan and Elliot negotiated successfully, their governments refused to ratify the pact. The Daoguang Emperor was furious that a treaty was ratified without his consent, especially one that would relinquish Qing land. And I don't blame him for being angry. Qi Shan definitely crossed the line with that one. So he ordered the arrest of Qi Shan who was sentenced to death, but was later commuted to military service. Lucky for him. Well, Lord Palmerston called Elliot back and refused to endorse the convention, wanting more concessions from the Chinese as per his first instructions. Yes, you see, Lord Palmerston's problem with it was that it wasn't enough in the favour of the British. Well, I think Elliot at this point probably just wanted to take a bit of a rest from all the fighting. Well, the temporary ceasefire ended in February, when the Chinese refused the British trade access to Canton. HMS Nemesis's longboat was fired at by artillery from a fort on North Wangtong Island on February the 19th 
which prompted a British response. The British commanders ordered a new Pearl River blockade and military operations against the Chinese. The British captured the remaining Bog forts in the Battle of the Bog and the Battle of First Bar on February 26th and 27th. It was this victory that allowed their navy to advance up river into Canton. And on the 26th of February, poor old Admiral Tian Pei died in battle. Rest in peace to Guan Tian Pei. Well, the British took Huangpu on March the 2nd after deconstructing a Qing fort near Pajo. This military operation directly threatened eastern Canton. Major General Gok, who had arrived from Madras on HMS Cruiser, personally led the assault on Huangpu. Superintendent Elliot, who was unaware at this time of his dismissal, and the Governor-General of Canton declared a three-day ceasefire on the 3rd of March. British forces left Zhou Shan for the Chunpi Convention and reached the Pearl River from the 3rd to the 6th. The Chinese military received more troops, and General Yang Fang led 30,000 soldiers near Canton on March the 16th. Now, as the main British fleet prepared to travel up the Pearl River to Canton, three warships headed to the Xi River estuary to navigate the river between Macau and Canton, HMS Samaral, Nemesis, and Atalanta, were Captain James Scott's and Superintendent Elliot's fleets. Even though the waterway was only six feet deep in some places, the British steamships could navigate in shallow waters and approach Canton from a route the Qing considered, at least at this point, to be unfeasible. Between the 13th and 15th of March, British forces captured or destroyed Chinese naval vessels along the river, and they also managed to get quite a lot of artillery and military equipment. After defeating Chinese defences along the Pearl River, the British considered marching to Canton. Superintendent Elliot advised the British to first negotiate with the Qing authorities from their advantageous position, rather than fight it out in Canton after the truce expired on the 6th of March. But the Qing, instead of attacking the British, decided to fortify their city. A turtle strategy. Chinese military engineers also began building fire rafts, gunboats, and mud earthworks along the riverside, sinking junks to form river blocks. Chinese merchants were ordered to seize all silk and tea from Canton to hinder trade, and the local population was forbidden from feeding the British river ships. A Chinese fort shot at a British vessel flying a truce flag on March 16th, and in response the British set the fort on fire with rockets. These actions convinced Elliot the Chinese were indeed preparing for a long battle. On the 18th of March, the British attacked Canton after the Broadway expedition ships returned to the fleet. They took the 13 factories, with very few casualties, and raised the Union Jack over the British factory. After negotiating with Koong merchants, the British partially captured the city and resumed trade. British forces captured Canton's elevated terrain after several military victories, and another ceasefire was finally declared on the 20th of March. Elliot ordered most Royal Navy cruisers downstream to the Boca Tigris, and that was despite the commander's objections. Now, moving on to mid-April, Yi Shan, the Viceroy of Liangguang and the cousin of the Daoguang Emperor, arrived in Canton. 
he ordered envoys to Elliot, kept trade open, and began gathering military resources outside of Canton. The Qing army quickly gathered fifty thousand soldiers from outside the city, while trade revenue was used to repair and strengthen the defences of Canton. Many small river vessels were armed. Chinese soldiers were stationed in Huangpu and the Boca Tigris, and artillery batteries were hidden along the Pearl River. Specifically, the Daoguang Emperor ordered the Qing army to eradicate the rebels at all locations, and expel British forces from the Pearl River, Hong Kong, and indeed, China in general. The foreign merchants in Canton, already skeptical of Chinese intentions, after learning about the Qing military expansion, widely distributed this directive. Some Koong merchants and their families managed to leave the city in May, raising concerns about a resurgence of violence. There were rumours that Chinese divers were training to cut openings in British ship hulls, and that fire raft fleets were being prepared to fight the Royal Navy. Due to the unit conflicts and distrust of Yi Shan, the Qing army weakened during their preparations. You see, Yi Shan was not from around here, and he publicly disdained Cantonese people and soldiers, preferring troops from other provinces. Yishan issued a statement on the 20th of May, urging Canton residents and foreign businessmen to simply be calm and just ignore the assembling military forces, as there was no likelihood of conflict. As you can imagine, pretty much nobody believed that. Well, the next day, Elliot formally requested that all British merchants leave the city before sunset, Additionally, several warships were ordered back to their positions in front of Canton. And on the evening of the 21st of May, the Qing struck. They launched a coordinated nocturnal attack on the British military and naval fleet. Qing soldiers recaptured the British factory after concealed artillery batteries in Canton and along the Pearl River were fired which the British thought were out of operation. They soon found out that they were well and truly in operation. Oh, and at Canton there were also two hundred fire rafts linked by a chain that were sent to attack the Royal Navy, while fishing boats with matchlock cannons engaged them. The British warships managed to evade attack, while wayward rafts lit Canton's waterfront, illuminating the river and countering the night attack. Slightly downstream, at Huangpu, the Chinese attacked British ships anchored there and tried to block the Canton-bound ships. Major General Goff delayed his offensive and consolidated British forces in Hong Kong out of fear of an invasion. He quickly ordered a march up river to Canton, and on the 25th of May, some four days later, the additional troops arrived, and the British retaliated by capturing the remaining four Qing forts above Canton, and commenced to bombard the city. After capturing the city heights, the Qing troops fled in fear, forcing the British to pursue them into the countryside. Around 20,000 peasants and townspeople attacked 60 Indian sepoys gathering supplies on May 29th. Well, the San Yuan Li incident defeated said sepoys. You know, it's just so funny to hear about all this because so many of these names, they're still, well, they're still places and areas within modern Guangzhou like San Yuan Li and Huangbu and Ban Yu, all these places. Well, Goff ordered a river retreat 
after the San Yuan Li incident. And then the British began to occupy Canton officially, on the 30th of May, 1841. Well, that, for at least now, ended the war. The British and Canton's governor-general agreed to cease fire after the British captured the province. Of course, this is the war in Canton, but there's plenty of other battles to fight before the day is out. Well, under the Limited Peace Agreement, also known as the Ransom of Canton, the British were paid to leave the forts. This withdrawal was completed quite quickly. In fact, the following day, on the 31st of May. But Elliot unilaterally ratified the peace accord without British army or navy input, once again stepping out of line, and this angered General Goff. Yishan declared Canton's defence a diplomatic victory, which, well, it's not as good as a normal victory, but you've got to swing it somehow, don't you? He wrote to the Emperor that the barbarians had begged the esteemed military leader to plead with the Emperor to forgive their debts and allow them to trade again. In exchange, they promised to quickly remove their ships from the Boca Tigris and never disrupt it again. However, General Yang Fang was chastised by the Emperor for accepting a truce rather than fighting the British. The Emperor was, however, unaware that the British mission had survived and was well and truly operational. Thus the Imperial Court debated China's war strategy, because the Daoguang Emperor wanted Hong Kong back. Now, after leaving Canton, the British Expeditionary Force went on to Hong Kong, British commanders discussed a war strategy like Chinese commanders. Elliot wanted to end military operations and resume trade, while Major General Goff wanted to seize Amoy and block the Yangtze, that being the Yangtze River, a little further north. Well, a July typhoon, which, well, there's a typhoon every July in Hong Kong, damaged the British ships that were in Hong Kong Harbour, and destroyed some expedition buildings on the island. On July the 29th, Elliot learned Henry Pottinger had replaced him as superintendent. On the 10th of August, Pottinger began his administrative duties in Hong Kong and he wanted to negotiate with the Qing dynasty for all of China, not just the Pearl River region. He refused Canton Chinese envoys and ordered the expeditionary force to proceed with its military plans. Admiral Sir William Parker arrived in Hong Kong to lead the British naval forces in China after Humphrey Fleming Senhouse died of a fever on the 29th of June. British commanders agreed to move combat operations north to pressure Peking. That's the old name for Beijing, by the way. Thus, on August the 21st, the fleet headed to Amoy. Now, British ships entered the Zhoulong River estuary and reached Amoy on the 25th of August. But the city was well aware that they were on their way. They had prepared for a naval attack by building a lot of gun positions in the gigantic granite cliffs that were overlooking the river by Qing military engineers. Parker thought a naval attack alone was too risky. So, Goff led a naval ground offensive against the fortifications. The Royal Navy's covering fire helped the British Marines and regular troops defeat the Chinese river defences on August 26th. And despite over 12,000 cannonballs from the British Navy, the Chinese cannon positions actually survived. British soldiers, however, did successfully ascend and take the position. When Amoy was empty 
on August the 27th, British troops went to the inner town and detonated the castle's powder magazine. They captured 26 Chinese junks and 128 cannons, and they threw them into the river. Lord Palmerston wanted Amoy to be a global trading hub after the war, but Goff issued strict orders to prevent looting and authorized officers to execute any pillagers found. However, many Chinese merchants feared being labeled as disloyal to the Qing, and they declined British protection. Now, the British troops did set up a small military outpost on a river island and blocked the Jolong River. But without military protection, peasants, criminals, and deserters pillaged the town. Well, order did return within days after the Qing recaptured the city. Following their victory, the city governor claimed that five British ships had been sunk. Now, back in Britain, parliamentary changes ousted Lord Palmerston as foreign minister on the 30th of August. Succeeding him was William Lamb, the second Viscount Melbourne, who took a more calculated approach to China. Lamb stayed with the war. September 1841 a short gunnery battle with the Chinese fort destroyed the British transport ship Nerbuda on a rock off Taiwan's northern coast. In March of 1842, the brig Anne sank on another reef. The survivors of both ships were arrested and taken to southern Taiwan for imprisonment, which is as fun as it sounds but the Qing authority were not so kind to the other 197 people they had, who they executed on August the 10th, 1842. And additionally, 87 of those prisoners died from mistreatment. This was called the Nerbuda Incident. Well, in October of 1841, the British consolidated their control over the central Chinese coast, Zhou Shan was ceded to Hong Kong by Qi Shan in January of 1841, and after this the Qing re-established military presence on the island. British troops invaded the island to prevent the Chinese from strengthening its defences, and the British attacked the Qing on October 1st. They defeated 1,500 Qing soldiers in Chu Shan, it was called the second capture of Chushan, by the way. And they took the city without too much of a hard time of it. Either way, the victory restored British control over Dinghai's vital port. On October the 10th, nine days later, a British naval fleet attacked and took control of a fortress near Ningbo, central China. It's sort of near Shanghai. There's a very nice city just to the south of it called Cixi. I went there once. It's quite a quaint little town. It's got a beautiful little park next to it. That's it. A lovely little lake. Oh, it's so lovely. There's nothing more charming than a second or third tier Chinese city. Oh, they're just lovely places to be. So peaceful. So nice. Well... This battle in Ningbo decisively defeated the Chinese. The 1,500 strong Chinese forces evacuated Ningbo after losing, and the British took control of it on October the 13th. British troops took over a city-based imperial cannon factory. Qing armament's replenishment was greatly hampered by this event. The city's conquest also threatened the Chiantang River, and the British leadership reassessed their strategy for Chinese occupation and war spoils, now that they had Ningbo under their wing too. More bargaining power. 
means they can tack on a few more war goals to that agreement. Either way, things were not looking good for China at this point. Admiral Parker and Superintendent Pottinger wanted the British to take part of all Chinese assets as war spoils, and they mean all of them. The whole thing. I mean, they may as well just try to annex them at this point. However, General Goff believed such a policy would incite Chinese resentment, as if the Chinese didn't already resent them enough. He believed that public property should be seized instead. British merchants were, after all, wronged, so the British doctrine required 10% of all property confiscated by British expeditionary forces to be taken as war spoils. Goff stated that this decree would force his troops to penalise one group of thieves for the advantage of another. British military operations were halted in the winter of 1141 to replenish supplies. The Emperor in Beijing underestimated the British threat due to Yishan's misinformation. The Daoguang Emperor discovered too late in 1841 that his canton and Amoy officials were actually exaggerating reports. I don't know why they do things like this. The individual ordered Guangxi governor Liang Chang Cho to report Canton events accurately, or else. Yishan was summoned to the capital and tried by the imperial court. Eventually he was removed from power. Thus, when the Chinese villagers and cities realized the true British threat, they fortified themselves against naval invasions, because someone's got to do it. In spring of 1842, the Daoguang Emperor ordered his cousin Yi Jing to recapture Ningbo. Rifles and naval guns helped the British garrison defeat the attack on Ningbo on March 10th, and the British lured the Qing army into the streets before attacking killing many of them. On the 15th of March, the British also captured Cixi after chasing the retreating Chinese army. Remember that charming little town I told you about? Oh, yes. Now, the Battle of Chapu on the 18th of May took the strategic port of the same name. Now, the British Navy bombardment forced the town to surrender. Goff lauded the eight, three hundred rather, eight banners, soldiers, who halted the British army for hours for their bravery. Now, on the June 14th, the British fleet took the Huangpu River mouth. The Battle of Wu Song on June the 16th gave the British control of Wu Song and Bao Shan. British troops occupied Shanghai's unguarded outskirts on the 19th of June, and the retreating Qing bannermen, British soldiers, and locals looted Shanghai after the battle. <clears throat> Qing Admiral Chen Huacheng also died while guarding a Wuzong fortress. A brave way to go. Now, the capture of Shanghai made Nanjing vulnerable to attack. And Nanjing is very important, because it literally name, what the name literally means, southern capital, Nan meaning southern, Jing meaning capital, as is Beijing means northern capital. Another thing, um, Tokyo in Chinese is Dongjing, so uh, that means eastern capital. There is no Xijing. I don't know. Maybe Xijing is kind of Xi'an. Go and look up Xi'an. It's where the terracotta warriors are. So, the capture of Shanghai made Nanjing vulnerable to attack. And that was a big problem. 
but the Qing Emperor protected Liangjiang province with 56,000 Manchu bannermen and Han Green Standard soldiers. They also strengthened their Yangtze River defenses, and to defend Beijing from an expected attack, the British Navy in northern China relocated resources and personnel. The Qing commander in Liangjiang province freed 16 British prisoners to achieve a ceasefire and buy a little time. Both the Qing and the British, however, rejected reconciliation. The Daoguang Emperor did secretly consider a peace accord with the British, but only for the Yangtze River. If the agreement was completed, if the British forces would have actually been paid to stay out of the Yangtze. Now, on July the 14th, the British Navy sailed up the Yangtze. Gough prepared to seize Zhenjiang after a reconnaissance revealed its strategic importance. Most of the city's firearms were actually moved to Wuzong and seized by the British after their takeover, and according to Chinese sources, more than 100 traitors were executed in Zhenjiang before the war due to poor organization by Qing commanders. The British fleet reached the city on July 21st and destroyed the Chinese force protecting it. An untimely British landing occurred after Chinese defenders withdrew to nearby hills. And thus, the Battle of Zhenjiang began in earnest when many Chinese warriors left the city, or at least tried to, causing a violent conflict. British engineers broke through the western entrance and entered the city, sparking street fighting. And the war devastated Zhenjiang, forcing many Chinese soldiers and their families to take their own lives rather than surrender. As for the British, well, they only lost 36 men while capturing the city. This doesn't sound like too much, but it was actually the highest loss for all of their battles in China in that war. Hmm, 36. Well, after capturing the city, the British fleet strategically severed the Grand Canal, which completely immobilized the Taoyuan system and hindered Chinese grain transport across the empire. The British left Zhenjiang on the 3rd of August to sail to Nanjing, and on the 9th of August they reached Jiangning district and were ready to attack by August 11th. Despite not having the emperor's approval, Qing city officials agreed to the British negotiations. Qi Ying, a Manchu high court officer, and Li Pu led a Chinese delegation from Nanjing to join the British Navy on the 14th of August. As the British delegation insisted the Daoguang Emperor accept the treaty, Negotiations lasted for weeks. But on August the 21st, the Daoguang Emperor did allow his ambassadors to sign the peace treaty with the British after the court recommended it. And this treaty of Nanjing ended the First Opium War on August 29th, 1842. The British and Qing officials signed the document on HMS Cornwallis. And just like that, the conflict concluded with the ratification of that inaugural unequal treaty, that dirty word treaty of Nanjing. The Qing Empire acknowledged Britain as a peer to China and were forced to grant British citizens extraterritorial rights in treaty ports in the Supplemental Treaty of the Boge. Hong Kong was also ceded to Britain, and in 1844, the United States and France both signed their own treaties with China. Furthermore, 
Alongside the opening of China to European opium traffickers, there was a significant increase in the European trade of Chinese coolie labor. English-speaking entrepreneurs commonly refer to this trade as poison and pigs. Ever wondered who built the railroads in the United States? Hmm. Coolie. Hard. Work. The Second Opium War occurred from 1856 to 1860, reigniting conflicts between China and Western powers, in particular Britain and France. It all began when Chinese authorities seized the Arrow, a vessel registered under the British flag, leading Britain to claim a violation of the Treaty of Nanjing. The war saw collaborative military actions led by Anglo-French forces, with key events including the capture of the Taku forts and the occupation of Beijing. The war ended with the Treaty of Tianjin and the Convention of Peking, which imposed even harsher conditions on China, including the legalization of the opium trade, the cession of Kowloon to Britain, and the establishment of foreign embassies in Beijing, treaties that further weakened the Qing dynasty and deepened China's century of humiliation. Welcome to the channel, everyone. Off we go for the second Opium War today. No part one and two in this one, just all the way to the end. Of course, if you want to learn about the first Opium War, you might want to look at the link in the description. Watch those two videos first, part one and two, and then you'll understand the context a little bit better. Now, as always, you're supporting the channel just by enjoying it, but liking and subscribing and perhaps telling your friends always helps. And if you want to go further beyond that, there's a few links in the description. But without further ado, let's get on with it. Now we all know that the Second Opium War was ensuing as a direct consequence of the First Opium War. You see, the Treaty of Nanjing, signed in 1842, provided Britain with an indemnity and extraterritorial rights. It also allowed for the establishment of five treaty ports and the transfer of Hong Kong Island to British control. The treaty's inability, however, to meet British objectives of it enhanced commercial and diplomatic ties resulted in the outbreak of this Second Opium War in 1856. In fact, the First Opium War is often regarded as a catalyst for the onset of modern Chinese history in China. What about the period between the two wars, though? What happened then? Well, it wasn't all peaceful, because it couldn't be. There were multiple instances of hostility towards British citizens. I wonder why. But as a response, in 1847, an expedition to Canton was launched. Now, I'm sure you know if you've watched the first videos, Canton is modern-day Guangzhou. And if you don't know what that is, or where it is, or what it looks like, you might just want to type it into Google and pick up your jaw from the floor, because it's quite a lovely city. Now, this military operation successfully attacked and captured the forts of the Boca Tigris through a surprise attack, resulting in the disabling of 879 guns. And that wasn't all. During the 1850s, Western imperialism experienced significant and swift expansion. You see, the Western powers, they had the same objectives, more or less, including the enlargement of their international markets and the creation of new ports of coal. You see, when you're sailing all across the world like they were, you can't really do it all in one go. You need to be able to stop, resupply, 
And, well, people need to be able to give you at least a good deal. You need to be welcome in these parts. And if you're not welcome in other people's ports, you must simply create your own or make other people's ports your ports. It's a tale as old as time. But you know that. Well, both the French Treaty of Huangpu and the American Wangxia Treaty included provisions that permitted the treaties to be re-evaluated and maybe even revised after a period of twelve years after their implementation. Now, Britain requested the Qing authorities in China to engage in further negotiations about the Treaty of Nanjing, which was signed in 1842, with the intention of broadening its rights and benefits. Well, this request was made based on Britain's claim of being a most favoured nation. Now, what does that mean? Well, it was written into the Treaty of Nanjing that Britain would indeed become the most favoured among the colonial powers. So we're talking the Russians, the Germans, French, Spanish, Portuguese, and some minor countries. But Britain was to be treated the best out of all of them, and that was written on contract. Well, but that wasn't all. The British demands encompassed the complete access of British merchant companies to all parts of China, the legalization of the opium trade, the exemption of foreign imports from internal transit duties, the eradication of piracy, and the regulation of the coolie trade. Authorization for a British ambassador to reside in Beijing, and finally the establishment of the English language version of all treaties as superior to the Chinese language version. You can see how this can become a problem. Mistranslations, interpretations, legal jargon. Of course, you don't get away with this sort of thing in any country anymore. Most countries have the rules that the local language contract always supersedes the second language contract, and China is no exception. So, in order to allow Chinese merchant vessels operating in treaty ports the same privileges as British ships under the Treaty of Nanjing, British officials provided these vessels with British registration in Hong Kong. In October 1856, Chinese marines in Canton apprehended a cargo ship named the Arrow on grounds of suspected piracy, and they detained 12 out of the 14 Chinese crew members. The Chinese government seized, and later sold the Arrow. Now, at the time of its seizure, the ship was registered as British, but it was once employed by pirates, and it was continuing to display the British flag at the time of its capture, despite the fact that its registration had lapsed. The captain, Thomas Kennedy, who was on a nearby vessel at the time, witnessed Chinese marines removing the British flag from the ship. Harry Parks, the British consul in Canton, communicated with Ye Ming Chen, the imperial commissioner, and Viceroy of Liangguang, that is the Guangdong and Guangxi, the two Guangs, to request the prompt release of the sailors, and a formal apology for the purported offence against the flag. Well, Ye was always a little stubborn, but he did release the nine crew members, but he withheld the release of the remaining three. So, on October the 23rd, the British demolished four barrier forts. On October the 25th, a request was made for the British to be granted permission to enter Canton. On the following day, the British initiated an artillery attack on the city, launching a single round at intervals of ten minutes. 
Ye Ming Chen offered a reward for capturing the head of every British person. That's one way to make money, isn't it? Well, on the 29th of October, the Royal Navy forcefully breached the weakly fortified and insufficient walls. The U.S. Consul, James Keenan, hoisted the flag of the United States on the walls and residence of Ye Ming Chen in Canton when his troops entered, and the casualties amounted to three fatalities and twelve injuries. But still, the negotiations were unsuccessful, resulting in the city being bombarded. On November the 6th, a total of 23 war junks were attacked, and they were subsequently destroyed. There were, however, intermittent breaks for negotiations, during which the British still launched bombardments, resulting in the outbreak of fires. On the 3rd of March, 1857, the British administration was defeated in a parliamentary vote concerning the Arrow Incident and the events that occurred in Canton till the end of the previous year. The outcome of this defeat prompted a general election in the April of 1857 and resulted in significant expansion of the government's majority. In April of the same year, the British government extended invitations to the United States of America and Russia for potential coalitions. But neither side was really keen on the idea. They were declined from both the Americans and the Russians. Well, it didn't help that in May of 1857 the Indian mutiny escalated, prompting the British to redirect their forces from China to India, as it was seen as the more pressing matter. Well, in terms of France, while they participated in the British intervention in China in response to grievances raised by their representative, Baron Jean-Baptiste Louis Gros, the accusations were regarding the death of a French missionary named Auguste Chapdelaine by local Chinese officials in the Guangxi province. It is important also to note, by the way, that Guangxi province was not accessible to foreigners during that period. So what exactly was the missionary doing there? Well, I suppose when you're on a mission from God, you go wherever the bloody hell you want, don't you? Just ask him. Either way, he didn't last too long. He got caught and they strung him up. So obviously the French were not, uh, not pleased with that. Well, Admiral Sir Michael Seymour led a collaboration between the British and the French. In the latter part of 1857, a combined military force from Britain and France launched an assault on Canton and successfully took control of the city. A collaborative committee comprising members of the Alliance was finally established. The Allies retained the city governor and his position to uphold on behalf of the victors. The British-French coalition exerted dominion over Canton for a duration of about four years. In May of 1858, the coalition swiftly advanced northward and successfully seized control of the Daku forts near Tianjin for a short period of time. The United States and Russia dispatched their own diplomats to Hong Kong, with the intention of providing military assistance to the British and the French. However, Russia did not provide any military aid. Well, during the war, the U.S. participated in a simultaneous but small fight. However, it declined the UK's proposal for an alliance and did not cooperate with the Anglo-French forces. The Chinese garrison stationed in Canton initiated an attack on the United States Navy steamer in 1856, which prompted the US Navy to respond with a counterattack, and this was known as the Battle of the Pearl River Forts. 
the ships launched a heavy bombardment of the river forts near Canton, subsequently launching an assault and successfully capturing them, without really much of a scratch on the American side. Subsequent to this, diplomatic endeavors were recommenced, resulting in the signing of an agreement between the American and Chinese governments, ensuring U.S. neutrality during the Second Opium War. Now, in 1857, the following year, British troops began gathering in Hong Kong, where they were later joined by a contingent of French soldiers. By December 1857, they possessed an adequate number of ships and men to finally address the failure to fulfill the treaty duties that granted them right to enter Canton. Parks issued a decisive demand, which was backed by the Hong Kong governor, Sir John Bowring, and Admiral Sir Michael Seymour, warning on 14th of December that Canton would be bombarded if the demands were not met within 24 hours. Remember those three remaining hostages, we could call them? They wanted them back. Well, I suppose you could argue, are three remaining hostages and a dead preacher worth starting an international conflict over? Well, if you're looking for an excuse to start a conflict, anything will do. And dare I say that they were certainly looking for an excuse, especially sitting in Hong Kong eyeing off the Kowloon, or as I'd call it in Mandarin, Zhou Long District. Well, you need some kind of excuse, don't you? Well, subsequently, the surviving crew members of the Arrow were set free, but they didn't receive any apologies from Viceroy Ye Ming Chen, who also declined to uphold the conditions of the contract. Seymour, Major General Van Straubenzi, and Admiral De Genoli devised a strategy to assault Canton in accordance with others. Orders, rather. The action was thereafter referred to as the Arrow Incident, which also gave rise to the alternate name for the subsequent conflict. It's also called the War of the Arrow, but I think the Second Opium War sounds a lot cooler. This has a better ring to it. Now, it was actually more about the Arrow than it was the Opium, so, I mean, we could argue that we should probably be calling it the Arrow War, but, well, it's a little too late for that, isn't it? <laughs> well, despite being hindered by the Indian Rebellion of 1857, which we mentioned, the British did proceed to retaliate against the Arrow Incident in 1856 by launching an assault on Guangzhou from the Pearl River. Viceroy Ye Ming Chen issued a directive instructing all Chinese soldiers stationed at the forts to refrain from opposing the British advance. Following the effortless capture of the fort near Canton, the British army proceeded for an all-out attack on the city. The seizure of Canton on the 1st of January 1858 a metropolis inhabited by more than one million people, but taken by a, a mere 6,000 soldiers, led to the British and French armies sustaining only 15 fatalities and 13 injuries. Thoroughly ratioed. Between 200 and 650 of the defenders and residents suffered casualties, now, Ye Ming Chen was apprehended, and he was subsequently banished to Calcutta, India, where he deliberately deprived himself of food until he starved to death. And in these days, Ye Ming Chen is kind of seen as a bit of a... 
I'm not sure if we can say hero, but perhaps a role model for not giving in to the British and the French ever. He stayed in his residence while it was being bombed and they were battering down the door, sitting at his desk, just thoroughly shaking his head. You'll have to break the door down, because I'm not opening it for you. Well, in January, there was a potential plot to poison John Bowring and his family in Hong Kong, which is now referred to as the Essing Bakery Incident. Now, it's a bit of a mystery whether it was all intentional or not, but if the act was intentional, the baker who was accused of contaminating bread with arsenic made a little bit of mistake by adding an excessive amount of poison to the dough. As a result, the victims vomited a significant quantity of the poison, leaving them with only non-lethal amounts remaining in their bodies. Messengers were dispatched with a warning, thus halting any additional harm. Well, upon its recognition in Britain, the Arrow incident, along with the reaction of the British military, sparked a significant amount of debate. On the 3rd of March, there was a vote, and a motion was carried by a vote of 263 to 49, expressing opposition to the government, and this is an excerpt from the minutes of that meeting. This house has heard with the concern of the conflicts which have occurred between the British and Chinese authorities on the Canton River, and, without expressing an opinion as to the extent to which the government of China may have afforded this country cause of complaint respecting the non-fulfillment of the Treaty of 1842, this House considers that the papers which have been laid on the table failed to establish satisfactory grounds for the violent measures at Canton in the late affair of the Arrow, and that a select committee be appointed to inquire into the state of our commercial relations with China. End of the excerpt from the minutes. Now, Lord Palmerston, the Prime Minister of the Whig Party, criticised the patriotism of the Whigs, who supported the resolution. As a result, Parliament was dissolved, leading to the British general election in 1857. Now, the Chinese matter played a significant role in the election, in which Palmerston secured a larger majority, thereby suppressing the opinions of the Whig faction members who were in favour of the Chinese side. Basically a pro, I say, pro-trade faction and a pro-war faction. Well, the newly established parliament has resolved to pursue compensation from China, relying on the report of the Arrow incident presented by Henry Parks. And Britain requested the French Empire, the United States and the Russian Empire to create an alliance. The first phase of the conflict concluded in June of 1158 by signing of the Four Treaties of Tianjin involving Britain, France, Russia and the US. Now, these treaties expanded Western commercial access to an additional 11 ports. Initially, the Chinese declined to formally approve these treaties, but, you know, what choice do you have? Now, the key provisions were as follows. That Britain, France, Russia and the United States would have the right to establish diplomatic legations, that being small embassies in Beijing, which was a closed city at the time. Also, ten more Chinese ports would be opened for foreign trade, including Niuzhuang, Tamshui, Hankou, and Nanjing. The right of all foreign vessels, including commercial ships, to navigate freely on the Yangtze River, the right of foreigners to travel in the internal regions of China which had been formerly banned, 
and also China was to pay an indemnity of four million taels of silver to Britain and two million to France. Well, the Treaty of Ai Gun was signed on the 28th of May, 1158, to amend the Chinese and Russian border, which had been established by the Nerchinsk Treaty of 1689. Russia acquired the territory on the left side of the Amur River, therefore extending the southern border beyond the Stanovoy Mountains. The Convention of Peking in 1860 granted Russia jurisdiction over a region on the Pacific coast that remains ice-free, leading to the establishment of the city of Vladivostok in the same year, and that is, to this day, right on the Chinese border, up sort of near Harbin. Well, in June of 1158, shortly after the Qing Imperial Court consented to the unfavorable treaties, albeit well, not very happily so, well, the assertive ministers convinced the Xianfeng Emperor to oppose Western intrusion. Signed agreements be damned. Thus, on June the 2nd, 1858, the Xianfeng Emperor commanded the Mongol general Senge Jinchen to protect the Taku forts, located near Tianjin. Senge Jinchen reinforced the fortifications by adding supplementary artillery units. In addition, he enlisted 4,000 Mongol cavalry from the regions of Chahar and Suiyuan. And thus we arrive at the Second Battle of the Dagu Forts, which were also known as the Dagu Forts in the modern-day Chinese vernacular. This was in June of 1159. An armada of 21 vessels, including 2,000 British troops led by Admiral Sir James Hope, embarked on a voyage from Shanghai to Tianjin. Their mission was to transport recently appointed Anglo-French diplomats to the embassies in Beijing. They navigated the estuary of the High River, which was protected by those Taku forts. Of course, they insisted on proceeding further inland to Beijing, and Sungai Rinjen said that the Anglo-French envoys may potentially arrive on the coast of Beitang and then continue their journey to Beijing. However, he declined to permit the presence of foreign armed forces accompanying them to the Chinese capital, for obvious reasons. Well, the Anglo-French forces insisted on disembarking at Taku instead of Beitang and accompanying the foreign diplomats to Beijing. During the evening of June the 24th, 1859, a small contingent of British troops detonated the iron barriers that the Chinese had positioned in the Baihe River. By the way, Baihe River means White River River. So in Chinese, you'll just say Bai He. Now, on the following day, the British soldiers attempted to forcefully navigate into the river and bombarded the Taku forts. The inability to dock due to low tide and the presence of soft mud hindered their progress, but nevertheless, Senge Rinchen's cannons effectively sank four gunboats and caused quite a bit of damage to two more. Despite being instructed to remain neutral, the American Commodore Josiah Tatnall defied these orders and stated that familial ties are stronger than alliances. He then proceeded to deliver defensive gunfire to safeguard the British convoy's withdrawal. The inability to capture the Taku forts dealt a significant damage to the represent reputation rather, of the British, leading to a peak in opposition against the foreigners within the Qing imperial court. Of course, if there is a hope that the foreigners can be defeated, well, a few more people are brave enough to openly stand up against them. Well, 
Back in India, that old mutiny was well and truly suppressed, and after it was all finished up, the Sir Colin Campbell, Commander-in-Chief of India, had the opportunity to gather men and resources for a further military campaign in China. Known as a military leader who was favoured by the soldiers, Campbell's first-hand experience of disease-related casualties during the First Opium War prompted him to ensure that the British forces were adequately equipped with ample materials and supplies, resulting in a relatively low number of casualties. And thus the Third Battle of the Taku Forts occurred during the summer of 1860. London once again sent Lord Elgin, with a combined army of 11,000 British troops, led by General James Hope Grant, and 6,700 French troops, led by General Cousin Mountaban. They advanced in a northerly direction, with a fleet of 173 ships, originating from Hong Kong. Their objective was to conquer the port cities of Yantai and Dalian, in order to secure control over the Bohai Gulf. On the 3rd of August, they executed a landing close to Beitang, around three kilometers away from the Taku forts. They successfully seized control of the forts after a duration of three weeks on the 21st of August. Now, the southern Chinese laborers, and quite a few of them, were enlisted in the military armies of both the French and the British. In fact, an eyewitness account states that the Chinese laborers, despite being considered traitors, served the British with loyalty and enthusiasm. During the attack on the Peho forts in 1860, they carried the French ladders to the moat, and, standing in the water up to their necks, used their hands to support the ladders, allowing the storming party to cross. Now, it was pretty uncommon to involve them in warfare, but they did show remarkable calmness in facing the risks of distant fire. They show a tremendous eagerness to confront their fellow countrymen and fight them to the death using their bamboo weapons. Well, if you ever watch any films about whether it be the Sino-Japanese War or any films about the century of humiliation, really, the running th thread trend, rather, in Chinese films is, is always those traitors, the Efialtes sort of characters. Always there. It's, well, it's one thing to be a foreign barbarian, as they call them, but it's another thing to sell out your own people when times are already bad enough as it is. Well, upon capturing Tianjin on the 23rd of August, 1860, it was reported that the British had abducted the prefect of Tianjin, as conveyed by the imperial messenger. In retribution, Parks was apprehended on the 18th of September. In addition, several British and French officers, Sikh soldiers, and a writer from the Times were also taken into custody. Parks and the others were incarcerated, subject to a little bit of torture, and subjected to questioning, which I'm sure the questioning was just more torture. Well, at least it was perhaps a little break from the torture. Well, the captives endured the torture of being binded up with rope, resulting in lacerations and subsequent maggot infestations in their flesh. Additionally, they were subjected to the forceful introduction of excrement and filth down their throats. Multiple individuals were sent to execution via decapitation, and their lifeless bodies were subsequently provided as sustenance to animals. The captured laborers who had labored for the Allies were subjected to a cruel punishment where they were buried up to their necks and left to have their 
faces chewed off by hungry dogs. Yeah, you don't want to get caught by the Qing government, that's for sure. Now, the Anglo-French forces engaged in combat with Sengo Rinchen's Mongol cavalry on the 18th of September at the Battle of Jiangjiawan before advancing towards the outskirts of Beijing for a more decisive engagement in Tongzhou. On the 18th, on the 21st of September rather, at Bali Chao, the Eight Mile Bridge, Senge Rinchen's army of 10,000 soldiers, which included the highly skilled Mongol cavalry, was completely destroyed when they rather foolishly attacked head-on against the overwhelming firepower of the combined Anglo-French forces. The French military forces reached the Summer Palace located outside of Beijing on October 6th, and the British troops landed there a day after. Following the severe defeat of the Qing army, the Xianfeng Emperor abandoned the city and entrusted his brother, Prince Gong, with the responsibility of leading the peace negotiations. Xianfeng initially sought refuge at the Chengde Summer Palace before eventually relocating to Rehe province. Anglo-French forces commenced the plundering of the Summer Palace and the Old Summer Palace straight away, and all of these sites were completely filled with rich artwork and all sorts of very valuable things from the old times of China, many of which have still not been returned. Everybody in China knows about the looting of the Summer Palace. When well, following the liberation of Parks, and the remaining detainees on the 8th of October, the ones that survived, that is, the full nature of their abuse became evident. The potential demolition of the Forbidden City was, well, debated about, as suggested by Lord Elgin, with the aim of dissuading the Qing Empire from employing kidnapping as a means of negotiation and seeking retribution for the ill treatment of their captives. Nevertheless, an assault on Beijing was excluded, as it had previously been declared as a menace in previous instances. Elgrin did make the decision to set fire to the Summer Palace, however, destroy the whole thing. He clarified in a written correspondence that the destruction of the palace was the retribution that would be imposed solely upon the Emperor, who as he thought, was directly responsible for the committed offence, rather than the people, who may be relatively blameless. So, instead of attacking the city with all of those casualties that would no doubt result from the bombardment, simply destroy the Emperor's little summer home. Well, perhaps the lesser of two evils, maybe, depending on how you look at it. Still, the loss of the summer palace is, oh, that is a tragedy. Imagine if somebody were to invade London and they destroyed Westminster Abbey. Think about it like that. Well, on October the 18th, the British troops set fire to the old summer palace. They asked the French for a little help, but they declined to provide assistance. The demolition of the structures was completed within a span of two days, during which the adjacent imperial property was also annihilated. According to most sources, the old summer palace was engulfed in flames for a duration of three days and three nights. Both Britain and France then issued campaign medals for their involvement in the Second China War and the 1860 China Expedition, respectively. The British medal was adorned with the following clasps. China was involved in several conflicts during the 19th century, including the First Opium War, the Farshan and Canton conflicts, the Taku Forts conflicts in 1858 and 60, and the Peking conflict in 1860. Well, on October the 24th, 
Some week later, Prince Gong, the Emperor's brother, acquiesced to the demands of the Allied forces. As the Emperor had already fled to Chengde on the September 22nd, British and French forces arrived in Beijing, where the Treaty of Tianjin was officially approved at the Convention of Beijing. The 1408 Ming Dynasty Yongle Encyclopedia, which was the greatest encyclopedia ever compiled in global history at that time, suffered significant damage during the sack of Beijing by the foreign armies and as a result, just 3.5% of the original volumes have survived to this day. And that's just one of the things that we lost. The British, French, and Russians were all given lasting diplomatic presence in Beijing. And despite the Qing Emperor's resistance, due to the implication of equality between China and the European powers, well, China was forced to pay a total of 8 million taels of silver to both Britain and France. Kowloon was relinquished to the British control and became a part of the British-owned territory of Hong Kong. The opium trade was officially given the green light, and Christians were given complete civil rights, including the ability to possess property and the right to engage in evangelism. Well, after a period of two weeks, Ignatiev exerted pressure on the Qing government to sign a supplementary Treaty of Beijing. This treaty resulted in the transfer of the maritime provinces located east of the Usuri River, which were part of Outer Manchuria to the Russians. Subsequently, the Russians established the port of Vladivostok between 1860 and 61 and the British press celebrated the Anglo-French victory as a great success for British Prime Minister Lord Palmerston, which significantly boosted his popularity. But I personally think Pitt the Elder is the better Prime Minister. Well, British businessmen were thrilled by the potential for trade and growth in the Far East, of course, a market that was surely had lots of untapped potential. Other foreign nations were also satisfied with the result, as they anticipated benefiting from China's decision to open up, or rather, the decision to open China up. Well, as for the Chinese, they were certainly feeling rather sore and sorry for themselves. The Qing army's defeat by a comparatively tiny Anglo-French military force although being outnumbered by at least ten to one, along with the escape and eventual death of the Shenfeng Emperor and the destruction of the Summer Palace, dealt a decisive blow to the dominant Qing Empire. Undoubtedly, by 1860, the Western powers had decisively conquered and subjected the ancient Chinese civilization, inflicting deep humiliation upon them. Following the war, China embarked on significant modernization efforts called the Self-Strengthening Movement, which led to the initiation of various institutional reforms. Due to the Qing government's growing financial obligations and the need to safeguard Westerners after their defeat in the Second Opium War and the imposition of the unequal treaties, opposition to Qing rule escalated. Now, William Edward Gladstone, a former British Prime Minister, was actually very vocal in his opposition to the opium trade, so don't think that everybody in Britain was all on the same side with this, because they certainly were not. Gladstone described the opium traffic between China and British India as most infamous and atrocious. He also vehemently imposed both of the opium wars, expressing strong disapproval of the British trade in opium to China and 
condemning British aggression towards the Chinese. In May of 1840, Gladstone strongly criticised it as Palmerston's Opium War, and expressed his fear of divine retribution upon England for its unjust treatment of the Chinese. Gladstone delivered a renowned address in Parliament denouncing the First Opium War, condemning it as a, quote, conflict that was even more unjust in its inception, a conflict that was even more deliberate in its advancement, resulting in a lasting stain on this nation's reputation. Now, the reason for his animosity for opium in general was the impact it had on his own sister, Helen. When Gladstone initially hesitated to join Robert Peel's ministry in 1841 due to his strong aversion towards the opium war, which was instigated by Palmerston. And with that, we end the video on the Second Opium War. I hope you enjoyed it. Interesting stuff, isn't it? I just wish they hadn't burned down the Summer Palace. I remember being in Beijing. It's one of those things that you just, well... You know that it would have been as great as the Forbidden City, if you could see it. The Forbidden City, by the way, is beautiful. Ugh. Imagine if they had have destroyed that. Imagine what the world could have lost. Anyway, I'd like to thank the top tier supporters and patrons. Dark, Kerry, Kimberly, Ember, Ben, Britt, Charles, Aaron, James, Jeffrey, Melissa, Scott, Stark Factory, and Wendy. Thank you very much, everyone. And I will see you tomorrow for more history. Same time, same place. Right here on YouTube. Lots of love to you all. Get a good rest. Good night.